Today is Friday, July 26th, 2024, and you have found the Living Youth Podcast. My name is John Robinson. I'm here once again with my podcast co-host and partner, Mr. Wallace Smith. Mr. Smith, how you doing on that sermon tomorrow? Do, doing all right. Uh, that's uh, done my best, I think, to focus my task for today. Uh, one, to do this podcast, which I'm very much looking forward to, and then also to focus on that sermon. So I, I have faith that by tomorrow when it's time to do it, it'll, it'll be ready to go. That's not, you know, I, I kind of had a, what appears to be a faulty assumption that when ministry who was out in the field for a while come into headquarters, that you, it sounds to me like you have five years worth of archives you can get into. <laughs> but I, I know, I know you, you rarely go back to an older one. You know, I do here and there every once in a while there's one, but I also, yeah, you also want to give new, new things too, and things that are on your mind. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a mix. All right. Today, what are we talking about? Well, today I thought, and I thought this would be a bit of a, uh, a fun and relaxing podcast for us as well. We kind of need it. We, it would be nice. Uh, I thought we would take a look at what I tend to call big picture passages or big picture verses. To me and in my life, uh, there's just some passages that stand out. And when I need a sense of the larger picture, these are some of my go-to passages. And I know you have some too. And so I, anyway, I thought we'd take a, take a look at some very tiny Bible passages that pack a big wallop. That sounds good. Going big picture today. We'll see you after the break. Thank you, Jay and Jay. Thought I'd change that up just a little bit. Uh, welcome to the podcast, uh, the Living Youth Podcast. It's our pleasure to be speaking to you, teens and young adults. Some of you have just come back from camp, and so hopefully your trip back has been a good one, that you are relaxed and you are rested and life is starting to feel normal again. I'm sure, I mean, I've seen so many of the pictures. I'm sure many of you are already missing the friends you made and such. And let me actually use this as an opportunity because so many of you are just getting the podcast on your YouTube feed or your getting it on Spotify or you're getting it on a uh, Apple podcast or even Google. I don't know if Google's still doing a podcast service. You can go to livingyouth.org. Every single one of these podcasts lives at livingyouth.org, but not only is there the podcast, there's also, uh, essays. We write different things here and there. It's a little more rare than the podcast content, but we do have things we write. Uh, various people have written things. Also, we find sometimes not just videos in the church. We've got uh, sermon selections and other things, but we also find videos just out on the internet. We find uh, some YouTube videos here and there that we'll also post that we think will be of interest to you. And in particular, given the last couple of weeks or so that some of you have spent, there are a ton of pictures from camp. So if you would like to see and relive the moments of camp, then head on out to livingyouth.org. There, wow, my uh, the photography team, I know my wife was on that, Ms. Braddock, they did a great job. It was just about two posts every single day almost of camp. I That's mean, pretty good. It really is, and there's a lot of photos. So anyway, head out to livingyouth.org, and not only is the podcast out there and lots of other things, but also you'll find a lot of photos from camp. So anyway, we know that some of you are hopefully refreshed and you've gotten back to, to normal in life. And, and we thought this would be a good topic. I, like I mentioned in the intro, you know, for me, sometimes I just need a reminder of a perspective. I need something that, that helps me to look at the larger picture. And there are certain passages in the Bible that do that for me. They don't all do the same thing. They don't all communicate the same message. And when we talk about big picture, sometimes that, that can be in different facets of your life. But I know I've always appreciated those. And it's not like the entire Bible isn't valuable. Of course it is. But for me, there's just some passages in particular that tend to, to really bring it home, that tend to really help me keep my mind on a larger picture so I don't get so caught up in, in some of the smaller things that sometimes can sort of bind me up and can start to, I don't want to use the word distraction, Mr. Robinson, but can, can kind of distract at some of the little details. And I need to be reset and have a larger perspective. Does any of that, does any of that oh, make yeah. sense, Mr. Robinson? So very necessary. That, that reminds me of, uh, it was Mr. Jerry Reddleston, who's our comptroller, I think. I'm not sure his actual title, but he, he's in charge of our finance department. And he said, you know, if you ever get a little down or discouraged, he said, go sit in the account room and read the letters that come in. You know, the people have sent in money or whatever, all the different things. And that, that 
people will tell you how you've helped them or changed their life or give them a new perspective. And we're obviously just doing God's work. We don't personally change anybody's life, but in the sense that we're following through on our mission and it's just, that's a good reset. I think of that as a, the idea of a reset that, wait a second, you know, why are we here again? What are we doing? What's the church's purpose? Oh, this is what it is making a difference in people's lives. Right. And I, right. I, I, I love the idea of, because it's so funny because between the two of us, this is not exactly right. The scriptures we came up with, and and of course the theme was big picture, but really were scriptures that should reset our brain to remember some important things. Like, you know, one of the ones I like that we'll get to later is the vast gulf between God's strength and my strength. Yeah. <laughs> was one of yeah. them. In fact, we have two that are very similar in that regard because we kind of came up with our, our list independently, but yet at the same time, I, I see there's definitely some overlap here and there. And so... I'll go ahead and start with one, and it's it's kind of difficult. I, I probably shouldn't start with this one because, in fact, maybe maybe I should. Maybe I should go with this other one first. You know what? I, I'm going to do that, Mr. Robinson. Go I know in my notes I've got a certain order, but I'm going to jump to one that overlaps yours really well. So maybe we can talk about those okay. two first because those actually help with the other one. So the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Let's <laughs> oh, just man, follow that is actually heart. one of mine. That, <laughs> I should have put that one on there. I, I guess this is a good time to highlight. These are not the only big picture passages. Uh, in fact, it was a little difficult to narrow. In fact, if I look in my notes, I'll see two that I have scratched out because we're trying to, to be in a reasonable amount of time. There are definitely others. In fact, we could even do this as another podcast in the future, mm. just another set of big picture passages. However, my real hope is that in hearing this, you will also, you dear listener, try to start creating your own collection of big picture passages. I remember one of my old Bibles, I think I had a list growing in the back of the Bible when I would really realize that, man, this, this passage is really helps me get a larger picture. And I would write it down as a big picture passage. And so I hope this moves you to say, and, and it's not just a matter of going through your Bible to find them. You come across these often unexpectedly, like maybe a minister refers to one in a sermon and you realize, oh, wow, this really just it helps me to see something, or you're just reading through a book of the Bible as part of your regular Bible reading or, or study, and something just resonates and helps you to, to really see a larger picture. So hopefully this will encourage you to look for your own. Uh, and, and even if, you know, so I know some of you are listening with, with your, your families are listening, or if not, you definitely talk to your mother and father reaching out to them and asking, you know, your mom and dad, Hey, what are some real mm -hmm. big picture passages for you that help you help you focus? What do you think about, you know, since we've kind of opened up the comments a little bit, at least on YouTube, um, it'd be interesting to see if people posted some, uh, some big picture scriptures yeah. that are meaningful to them. Cause uh, you're right. I'm glad you said that. Like we're scratching the surface. In fact, I could see somebody listening to this whole podcast and going, really, that's your big picture ones. What about this one? You left this one out. Like, sure. I get it. I, but I like how you framed it because one of the ones we're going to read from, from my side really was, a just reading through no intention. And I was like, boom, wow, that hit me that, that, that this is the best verse I've seen that makes me feel because uh, I'm getting my topic too early. It's a, it's a marvel that God's able through the Bible to occasionally convey to you because, you know, the idea of being a father, for example, well, we can have an idea what God must feel like with us as his kids. When you're a mm -hmm. father or a mother, you get a little bit of the feeling that God feels. And so he's done such a great job, job of structuring our lives so we can have some sense of it. Right. And mine put the scale together in my mind in a way I'd never thought about before that was, was quite Oh, that's quite neat. Oh, boy, I can't wait to hear that one. You know, this is also a good time to say that we're not saying, you know, sometimes people will use certain kinds of language that frankly is often being borrowed from the uh, the evangelical world or sort of the, uh, I say, the loosey-goosey kind of a Christian world where it's really what certain verses are saying to you as if somehow mm. these verses don't have a fixed meaning. And we're not trying to contribute to that. That is a delusion. God, God means what he means in the scriptures. I remember, honestly, when God was opening my mind, when I wasn't in the church yet, but I was starting to, my mind was being open to it. Actually, a discussion I had with my mother. She, my mother was concerned about what I was learning because she felt you could just make the Bible say anything you want. You know, it's like, well, the, you know, the, people can make the Bible say anything they want. And, I, and I, even then, I understood. She, she thought of it like poetry. You know, like, uh, which some poetry it's, 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 it's is it, like even the author of the poem didn't mean for it to mean anything. It's just whatever you want it to mean. And I, I just think that's pretty lame, frankly. I apologize if I insulted a bunch of artists and think that's the right way to go. But I tried to explain to my mom. I said, well, yeah, that might be for some poems, but there are other poems where the author truly means to say something. 
And even if other people interpret it differently, it doesn't change the fact that he meant to say something. And the Bible is God's word to us, and he means to say very specific things. So we're not trying to say that, well, you know, what does this verse really mean to you? No, what it mean, what's important is what it means to God, what God means to say in the verse. However, there is a personal aspect to this, which is the part that we bring to it because certain things resonate with us differently because of our experiences so that when God says something, we might need to hear it more than the guy next to us, or, mm-hmm. or it might resonate with some experience we've had yeah. in such a way. So I'm not saying there's not a personal aspect, but make sure yeah. you don't think that we're trying to get caught in this kind of fuzzy gooey stuff, which is, which is kind of a fake Christianity. Well, I, I was, so Dr. Phil had a new book that, that was coming out. I, I start to realize when somebody I've heard of starts appearing on five different podcasts, they usually they have got a new something book up. out. Yeah, exactly. And so I listened to a couple of them, but there's one I listened to at length because I was kind of, it got more into Dr. Phil's own personal philosophy because he admits that he free, freely admits that he's a Christian, that he believes in God and all this kind of stuff. But he really did go through and talk about the Bible as if, it kind of speaks to you individually and the scriptures are kind of um, it's kind of your truth. It's the thing that hit for you. And really? he, he, I think he would maybe if you, if you confronted him and said, so what you're saying is, you know, speak your truth, you know, they're different. I, mm-hmm. I think he would push back on that, but his message, when you listen to it really was the idea that you can interpret things in one way and that's what you need for you in your life there. And other people oh, can, too can, bad. can, yeah. So, and it was not, I was a little, more than a little disappointed. That would be disappointing. Well, God has something to say, but that resonates with us different ways at different times in our lives. And in this, in this first one in particular has long resonated with me. Uh, I know I, I think I'd read it before it did, but then something hit me when I was really trying to understand these things about, about God. And it's from Job 26. It's Job 26 and verse 14. These are words of Job. And leading up to verse 14, he's been talking about different examples about how great God is. He gives example after example, and he, and there's so much in the book of Job that does that, mm-hmm. trying to help you understand the greatness of God through the physical creation. We can look at the design of, of the eagle and how it flies in the air. You know, we can see all these things. But then he, it's like at the very end of this, he he raises it up a notch. And I mentioned this in a recent sermon that I think was just released about how to think about God when suddenly he ups it. It's like all that you can talk and you can talk and you start to open your mind how big something is. And then you cap it off by saying, and yet, man, that is not even, that's not even the beginning. And it comes there in Job 26 and verse 14, where after saying these things, Job then says, indeed, these are the mere edges of his ways and how small a whisper we hear of him, but the thunder of his power, who can understand? And I notice you've got, you've added to the notes here, a different translation, the new living translation. What does the SE mean? Is that like special? second edition? Second edition. Okay. So the, and there was the NLT, then the second edition NLT was a little more like the living Bible. Ah, <laughs> second edition is firmed it up a bit. Yeah, firmed it up. Oh, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Well, you don't have to read it. I, no, I, I kind of like it. It says here in this, the new living translation, second edition, these are just the beginning of all that he does merely a whisper of his power. Who then can comprehend the thunder of his power? I like the merely a whisper of his power. Oh, that's I, really nice. Yeah. I agree. You know, I, the math guy in me likes the statement that these are the mere edges of his ways. And I think I mentioned in that sermon, it's probably kind of nerdy, but if you have a cube, if you want to think of a Rubik's cube, feel free. But the edge, it's not even the face. I mean, the, a cube is three-dimensional and the face is two-dimensional. It's the flat surface. But the edge is just where the two faces meet. It's, it's literally a line. It's one-dimensional. It has theoretically no I'm, width to it. I am actually glad you defined that because I was actually thinking more of a side. Oh, interesting. That's right. Now, you know, I am, I am speaking mathematically. It could be that in a lot of ways you would say the edge, meaning the boundary, and you mm-hmm. could include a side. But at least this, in terms of how I have been impacted by this, the spirit of that is he's saying that you're not even seeing the whole, you're yeah. see, you're seeing the bare front. You're seeing just this kind of shallow edge of his ways. In fact, like he says here, it's like he has this thunderous power and all you're hearing is a tiny whisper. And yet what you're seeing is you look at the grand Canyon, look at Niagara falls, look at the stars and look at space and, and then contemplate the big bang and all these vast things. And yet all of that, consider all that everything you can experience 
it's virtually simply a whisper of God's power. And if, and if the thunder, who could even comprehend the fullness of that? Well, this, this verse is one of those big picture verses to me. And it's one that Job, Job himself, if you go to the end of Job, you recognize even he didn't fully grasp. Because one of the things he says later, but we're, we're not going to turn to a lot of verses, and I just want to focus on these verses, but I will highlight what he says later, is that he admits to God when he, is in, when he finally has entered the repentant place that God was helping to get him to, that it's like he was saying things with his mouth, but he didn't fully understand yeah. them. He said that now he had grown to the point where it's like his eyes see the fullness of it. And this is one of those things where you recognize even Job didn't grasp the fullness of what he was saying. And it's a beautiful statement about just the grandeur of what God is and a reminder to myself of how small I should consider myself in comparison. Yeah, it's interesting because, well, first of all, I'm shocked shocked to tell you that you have a job scripture in here this one of, <laughs> <laughs> one of your favorites and you worked math into it i think we're yeah. on point here but the the big picture kind of job overview of like if from, from the beginning to the end of job what are the things that we're supposed to learn well i I, th- I think one of the takeaways is that job himself seemed to have felt like he had a pretty good handle on god mm, and, and yes like, and, and what that meant and his power and his majesty but after this harrowing journey of pain and suffering and loss at the end he concluded oh i don't know what i was talking about yes. I, I didn't know a fraction of what god's power and capability were now you know what it also reminds me of the difference now this this feels weak by comparison but still when you were saying this it's the difference between knowing something and being able to teach it because there's mm. been a couple times where I've given a sermonette, especially early on where it wasn't maybe even the main p- point that I was making, but I start to explain something that I only fuzzily understood in my own brain. Mm. And you don't realize until you're standing in front of a group of people trying to explain something that you yourself only fuzzily understand <laughs> that it goes badly. Yeah. And every time it was like, Oh wow, I didn't know that nearly as well as I thought I did. Yeah. You know, I experienced that what, cause I got my degree in mathematics and I took more calculus than anyone would ever, you know, want to take, not just the regular calculus, but then later the, the, the other calculus you do after the calculus. And yet I would, I would agree with that. It wasn't till I actually started teaching calculus in um, high school that actually some of those things really sank in, in a different way and I understood them better. And I think that's a great analogy. I, among the reasons that this verse really helps reset me, not only does it, does it humble me, like when I start thinking I've got God figured out, he's like, oh yeah, I understand God. It's like, yeah, right. Sure you do. You, you do not. He is so much greater. But it also reminds me of, of why, of among the many reasons why I can truly trust my, my life to him because his perspective is larger. His wisdom is grander. His power is greater. Anytime I start to wonder if something is beyond God and his ability to do something, I hit that verse and realize, yeah, not even, mm-hmm. not even close. Mm-hmm. God, God really can do all that he imagines and all that he wants to do. And it's a great perspective setting yep. verse for me. Well, you know, you, you, you've led in perfectly to one of the things I've grappled with, which is there, there's very much a theme from Genesis to revelation of God trying to get across to us just those very things how much more infinite his um, big picture view is than ours, the, the way things really work, the safest paths to go down. And we can take in a, one of the lessons I learned, I, I find, I'm surprised how often in my, in my own mind, I refer myself back to the first sermon I ever gave, which was, do you include God in your decision-making? And the, the whole purpose of it was I, when cleaning out this office, it was, it was a trip down memory lane. And mm-hmm. I thought of, cause I found receipts and different things. And I was like, Oh, well that didn't turn out so great. <laughs> and it wasn't because I just casually did something. No, I had done research on it. I had done all these things that humanly speaking was like you did your due diligence, but there are just factors that we have no idea of or can't mm-hmm. comprehend or the, you know, I think, I, I would I would actually kind of point to social media a little bit when social media came out at first and like the idea of Facebook, let's say, well, what a great way to keep up with family across the country. What a great way to keep what up. What a good with, thing. Yeah. And elements of it are good. But now I, uh, you know what, uh, almost 15 years later, even secular people are when we're not sure that social media was such a great idea. But, but if you go back to the, when Facebook and Instagram in particular came out, that we, 
could we have actually maybe maybe somebody really forward thinking could have predicted where this would take us but most of us we had to go down this journey to get to where we're like hey social media maybe yeah. not so great and and some real negative toxic effects so so anyway the, you, you know god is always trying to get us to comprehend no listen i have a strength and a power you can't imagine so i'm like okay i'm trying to imagine it <laughs> so i've read this before and actually recently because I, I i think somebody commented on it but i was reading isaiah 42 in fact i have if we have time later I might mention another Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42 is such an interesting, it's a real pivot in the story of Isaiah, which is why some people think somebody other than Isaiah wrote it. You know, Isaiah 1 through 40 is, Isaiah was alive and it runs all the way up to the end of King Hezekiah. But then when you, when you come out on the other side in Isaiah 41 and 42, a lot of time has passed. And so people assume that uh, somebody, Deutero Isaiah, if you guys have heard of that. Uh, so a different guy wrote it. And, but there's a lot, packed into Isaiah 41 and into 42 that uh, have some real baseline stories. But anyway, so, I, so as I'm studying through Isaiah, oh, this is back to Isaiah 40, actually, because I have an Isaiah 42 I like as well. But I'm reading, Behold the nations are as a drop in a bucket. Now, think about how God can give us small-scale examples in our own life to begin to get an idea of how he feels. So you and I would never think the nations are but as a drop in the bucket. You know, we're in awe of studying the Roman Empire and what a machine it was and right. you know, the Persians and all these others. Okay, so we can get an idea of dropping something into a bucket. We can visualize that. And are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the aisles as a very little thing. Okay, and even within this scripture, you can, you can see this contrast that God has drawn to put it in human terms so we could understand, oh, you know, dropping some, some, some dust that's on scales. Well, the thing is, I don't ever use scales. <laughs> and I don't know how much dust weighs, but I know it's not very much. But I, I was struggling. Not struggling. It, it wasn't hitting home to me the way the New Living Translation put it. Ah. Would, again, I've read this before. Let's be full, um, full disclosure. No, for all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. Hmm. And that's the one that really hit home to me. Because my, my family's life over the last, say, five, six, seven years has transitioned to, if we, we want to at least once a year try to get to the beach, okay? Hmm. You know, if you go to the beach the probability you're going to have sand on you is 100%. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is yeah. when you're dusting off and it's time to go and you're packing everything up and you stand up and you look down and you still have like 10 grains of sand on your hand, no matter how much you've wiped them off. But the thing is I could have walked all the way back to the car with those grains of sand on my hand and not even been Would aware even of it. Wow. So if God in his infinite strength and capability and understanding is like, Hey, look what's going on on the earth, all the nations that are raging and out of control. To me, it's as if I had sand stuck to my body and, and was walking around not even aware it was there. Wow. And that's the one that really, it really was kind of the push, you know, mind blown. Even though there's lots of, that scripture alone, even if you just stick to the New King James Version, has embedded into it the idea. Like dust on a scale. That's It's not even probably going to register on the scale right. that it's on there. Oh, I didn't think about it that way. Because yeah, you you assume your scale is not completely dust free. You just don't worry about it. Yep. The dust is not going to be enough yep. to throw off your calculations. Yep. So you just let it sit there, and it's it's like a nothing. Well, that's a great way to so put it. Back to your big picture things, like you were saying. Yeah, you start to realize no matter how much trouble we get into or how much themes things seem unsolvable, God's like, no, I got it. You know, I it's just not a hard thing for me to take care of. Even all the raging nations on the earth are easy for me to deal with right. by comparison, by comparison. And, you know, even on those other, cause uh, there's a few, my wife and I have a Sabbath playlist. We'll listen to, you know, on the Sabbath. Guess what? That's why it's Living called Sabbath Youth Podcast. Playlist. Uh, well, it's, that, that does show up. It's not on the playlist, <laughs> but it does show up. But there, there's some songs that, that we listen to that kind of remind us also of when you're dealing with the fact of say, God choosing not to intervene. Like, you know, uh, when he hasn't parted the waters for you, you know, or something, but passages like this also remind that it's not that God's hand is shortened so that it cannot save it, that still cry out to him. But even if he never does choose, it's because in his wisdom and greatness, it's that he has realized this actually fits his plan better. What it's not because of is because he can't, he is eminently capable of doing everything everything that he conceives to the point that even all of humanity, human history is virtually like a grain of sand in his hand. And 
there's something about going through a trial, recognizing that God is consciously choosing to allow it. We, we have to learn to struggle with those things. It can make, it can turn us bitter if we're not careful, or if we kind of recognize just like when a parent chooses to allow their child to go through something, it's not out of lack of love. It's, it's because their loving choice has been to allow this. Mm-hmm. And of course, God has the largest stakes in the world that are going on. So that can be of something really large, but at the same time, it, it does inject, at least for me, passages like what you just read there in Isaiah, a bit of hope in that circumstance because God in his, in his greatness and his glory has chosen to allow this circumstance, even on the largest scale, even if it's wars, whatever the case is, because it is serving a larger purpose. That, that's a great picture of the scale of God. And I don't think I've really thought about those, Mr. Robinson, to the way you described them as like dust, not really affecting the scale uh, or for that matter, I would have, I would have thought of him actually literally picking up a grain of sand, but your story about going, you know, going to your car and not realizing that, that, I mean, just even noticing those tiny grains are still on there. Yeah. That's a good one. It didn't, the sand didn't even slow me down a bit. I still, I still (laughs) moved at the same pace to get back to my car. And, you know, I think I, I appreciate what you added there because I think that's, that's encapsulated in the idea of the, um, the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. We tend to focus on what happens to the son and understandably, but you know, the father, knew he had to let the son go because he need there was a valuable lesson he needed to learn. And then the father didn't enjoy it. And the son did go and waste everything he had with prodigal living and, and found himself in a situation that was lower than a slave. Like he, and his conclusion was I could at least go back and be a servant in my father's house. Right. And the, and the father accepted him, but you know, the father kind of knew how this was going to play out. Right. And right. He, and he had to let him go and learn that lesson. Yeah, it's it's not like when the son went through those things, the father didn't know what he was going to go through. What he didn't know was whether the son was going to come back or not. You know, he hoped right, that he would, right? right? But he, yeah, he definitely, those things were not a surprise. Okay, so moving on then, uh, pressing ourselves forward. Here's why I, I kind of did them in this order, which is not the way we had them listed in our notes. But I feel like understanding that first helped set the stage for the next one I was going to bring up. Okay. I like that our our two our first two really really kind of jive like that, um, and that's in First John three, verses one through three, and this was actually early on one of the when I first started kind of tripping over the idea of big picture verses. I want to make sure that I'm aware of um, this one. Just really started to hit me in a way as I was trying to think of our purpose and such. And in First John three verses one through three, we read John writing the following. He says, behold, what manner of love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. And you could just pause right there, but Mm -hmm. I, let me, let me continue. Therefore, he says, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, that is Jesus Christ, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, why this resonates with me in a certain way was well, just multiple reasons. One, John, this could sound very weird, but John gets it, right? You realize John gets it. And I say that like I got it and John didn't. No, John well, gets it and seeing John get it helps me get it. Well, don't you think an element of it is the, the, the interesting thing, like I try to keep in mind that first, second, third John were written towards the end of his life. Oh so, yeah. So like yeah. he, this is really like, okay, look, I, I was actually alive and, and walked around with Jesus Christ and, you know, 60 years later or whatever it is, um, 70, here's what I've learned. Here yeah. are my conclusions. Here's God I must leave you yeah. with. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think it punches, not punches. It has more of an impact because of it was written at the end yeah, of his life. That's a, oh, well, that's a great thought, Mr. Robinson. So when he says that even the very beginning, you behold what manner of love the fathers have showed on us that we should have, we should be called children of God. Like he gets it. It's like, it's easy to think, oh, you know, I'm a child of God. How great. And I've seen that thrown out here and there in say evangelical circles and even yeah, I can carelessly say that, no, look, I'm a child of God. I need, but that should be a mind blowing reality. What is that? Is, what, to be a child of God, one, 
and for all of this, go back to the passages we were just talking about, you know, the great one for whom all of the earth is like a, a, a tiny bit of sand on his hand. This, this being that, that even the most magnificent things we've experienced in this world and even terrifying, like vast hurricanes and earthquakes, that's just the edges of his power. This in this intense being and we, he actually calls us his children, right? John says that, do he's in a sense asking with a statement like this, do we comprehend the greatness of the love of God that he should take creatures as small as us, as relative nothing compared to him, and be willing to elevate us to a stage that we are actually his own offspring and what he's doing in our lives to make that happen? That is astonishing. In verse two, and and the rest of verse one, you can highlight, there's a reason if you're truly acting in line with the things of God, the world doesn't understand you because you're acting in accordance with your father, not the father of so many lives of this world, and they can't comprehend that. But then verse two, highlighting, and this this can be confusing, it's, it's important to get it right. He says, now we're children of God, like right now, but it hasn't yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, that is Jesus Christ at his return, will be like him for see him as, as he is. You know, some in the world have accused us of saying, oh, yeah, you, this whole idea of being born at the resurrection is not really in the Bible. You guys make that up. That's not what born again means. I'm sorry. This is literally a picture of it right here. When when we were pregnant with our children, I like to, I always like to say we, like I somehow had to bear the burden as well. I got my tummy got bigger, but I didn't have no babies. My uh, my wife had to actually bear those children. But yet, even before the child was born, you know, we're talking to it in mm-hmm. the tummy. Mm-hmm. You know, you're you're because you definitely this is this is your child. But if you actually look at the growth stages of a child, it, it the first thing it looks like it looks more like a tadpole. You know, it looks yep. like it does not look like a human yet. But yet over time, it begins to acquire those characteristics. And really, in our experience, we don't really see the child until it is born. I mean, thanks to technology, we can see it earlier. But once it's born, you see the child. Yep. But really, if you could imagine the child seeing himself, once the child is born out of the womb, that is the first opportunity the child has to in a sense, see mm-hmm. itself by looking, looking at yeah. its mother, looking at its yeah. father, which really and, are the two things that made it. And, and seeing the characteristics of their parents in, in their own. That are going to be reflected yep, yep. in those features. And when do we actually finally see what it is that we are becoming? Because he does say, shall be like him. It's when Christ is revealed, when one of the divine family is revealed. And so for the first time, as fully developed children, we will see our own destiny because it'll be revealed to us in his visage and we will already be radiating that as well. And so now we are called the children of God. We're still in a sense in utero. We're still developing. And then finally, verse three brings it home because it's easy to think all this is just abstract information, but it's not, it's not just academic. It's not just, uh, you know, sort of facts, you know, abstract facts. Because it says in verse three, there's kind of this promise that everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. That is, when you truly are filled with this understanding, when you recognize the greatness of what God is doing in your life on a day-to-day basis, not in terms of working miracles in your life, but working your life as a miracle, helping your character to grow as you yield to him so he can continually, moment by moment, help to form his character in you. He is shaping the inside of you so that it reflects the inside of him so that when the first John 3 moment comes, when Christ is revealed, you will reflect him in its fullness. That to me is a big picture passage. It reminds me that that salvation is the helmet of the armor of God, that it's what helps protect my mind, that focusing on this hope of salvation and what God is doing in terms of turning me into a full child of his, the more that we truly understand that, the more there's not a single aspect of our lives that is not impacted by that understanding. And we cannot help but fulfill verse three as we purify ourselves because we long to be pure like Mm -hmm, he is. mm -hmm. You know, um, I think you bring out such a great point the the idea that we could be sons of God. Um, nobody even thinks about that in the world. Like the, the mainstream Christianity, the best you could do is you become an angel, right? You go to heaven and you become an angel or something along those lines. And I, I've only heard anecdotal stories about Mr. Armstrong 
as God was revealing to him his master plan being far more amazing than we realize right. that you no know, God appears to be reproducing himself through through us and that we could actually be lit excuse me literally reborn in a spiritual sense as a true son of God that is mind blowing alone right there mm. and then i then then sometimes it makes me think about okay like if we were just using human reasoning what would our expectation be because you know um especially there in the new testament uh, i think I always attribute everything to Paul, yeah. uh, the, but but the scripture that talks about you know the 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 men of this world when they have authority lord it over you. Mm. Oh, no, it was yes, Christ, yes, it was Christ talks about that. Yeah, right? and he's saying, look, I'm you know a, a, a true good leader actually serves his people, and so if we were thinking, okay, so so God created mankind, you know, in the garden He gave them enough understanding to know what they were supposed to do. We decided we were going to not accept that and go our own our own way, and we've suffered greatly for the last six thousand years. Mm-hmm. But this plan's put into place to reconcile us back to God, so we can get back to where we have a relationship with Him. But I don't don't you think if we didn't know the rest of this, that that would just be our expectation? We'd just be happy that we got into alignment with God, and He wasn't uh, going to kill us. Back to the Garden of Eden, exactly. You know, or something. Exactly. That's it. So for Him to not only do that, make a path that we could be reconciled to Him, of course, He He sets the stipulations, and we have to agree to them. But then, no, 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 it's more than that. You can actually be in the family of God. That's, again, you know, mind-blowing yeah. kind of idea. And so I, I love that scripture. I appreciate you bringing that uh, up. I'm glad you said that because I, I have seen some in mainstream Christianity. It's so funny. Sometimes they, they'll, they'll come and knock on the door of the truth, but then just turn yeah. around and not do it because I, there's talk where people seem to recognize, and they, they see the verse that says we'll be greater than the angels. They, they see those things. Uh, I've seen one talk about well, we're going to be ruling or reigning in some way. But then when they come up to the idea that God is literally making you a part of his family, not just in an analogous sense, but as one of the family, like Christ is one of the, it's, it's, it's just like, well, they, well, they start falling into human philosophy. They say, well, no, that, that's not possible. Or it can't be, it can't be that they just can't embrace that. And, and they walk away from that. But to Mr. Armstrong's credit and Dr. Meredith used to tell the story so many times, that, Cause he was there. He was, he was there. He was a part of the work when, when Mr. Armstrong was come to this conclusion, he said, Mr. Armstrong used to think, well, maybe we're going to be like a super archangel mm-hmm, or, you know, something, mm-hmm. but that he told his boys, you know, he said, you know, boys, I, I feel like this is what the Bible says. It wasn't like a vision or something. He's literally just looking at the verses in the Bible. And I, I, the way I like to put on the telecast, I'm bringing it up is essentially approaching the Bible. Like Jesus Christ said, be a child, be a child who's open to the craziest of thoughts. And it seems like these verses are saying that, but help me punch holes in it because this is a pretty radical thing to think. And to their credit, and of course to God who was working in them, they recognize, no, that really is it. We really are being added to the family of God. And yeah. that's a, that's astonishing. So, so should I move, should we move on? Yeah, to the next let's, one? let's do, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm curious as to which one you're going to do next. Here on the I'm going to do the Matthew six one. All right, good, good. In fact, I'm, I was looking at this. Um, you know, if I did this one and you did acts, we'd probably pretty, be pretty well rounded. Out. You think so? All I right. So. All right. Okay. Again, uh, yet another one I've talked about on the podcast before. I, uh, I can't remember who I was talking to very recently. And I thought, ah, I've entered the older age of my life where I retell my own <laughs> stories. <laughs> yeah. My kids have started telling me, yeah, dad, yeah. You, you told us that one. They're starting to make it explicit to so me. You're it's like, a little painful. Zip it. You're going to listen to it again. Here's, <laughs> okay. Matthew six, one and two, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward for your father in heaven. Therefore, this is the key. Verse two is really the key one. I, I'm, okay. You know, you and I are both context guys, but in slightly different ways. And I, I you know, if a group of scriptures clearly go together, I like, I like to read them. Sure. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Mm. And the, I, you know, if you, if we, we could do a podcast on the five most terrifying scriptures in all the Bible, <laughs> I would put this in my top five. Really? That's interesting. I, yeah. I think we should, because it's so meta. Now, if we just want to, if, if you just want to limit this and say, oh, if you're doing nice things for other people, you know, that's essentially what charitable deeds are, helping people out and you make a big deal out of it, make sure everybody knows how generous you were and draw attention to it and all the fanfare that, that God gives you essentially no very little credit for that. And that's what your reward is, is that people saw that you did this charitable Mm. thing. But if you go big picture, you know, Dave Ramsey 
uh, we we took we I read his book and uh, didn't listen to his his show so much, but we did go through his courses on how to manage your money because okay, I know a lot of people that have been through that. Yeah, I mean like total money makeover stuff and all yeah, that. total money exactly exactly. So you know, twenty something years ago, my wife was out of control with the credit cards, and I'm like, <laughs> babe, you're gonna have to stop. And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> she was the voice of reason. I was oh, I, I was the uh, I was the loose uh, finance guy. Talked about opportunity cost. He talks about what it takes to slowly build and get to a financial situation. But along the way, there are going to be temptations of how to use your money. And you mm. have to think in terms of, well, if I, he, he tells the story, I don't know if this is the best example. There's some kind, I think it was a Mercedes that he'd always wanted. And so he made himself save the money. It was like, it was a lot. It was like $40,000 or something, which $40,000 30 years ago wow, money, you know, right, so who right. knows what that would be now. And he, one day he got to it and he had the money. He could do it. He just, what should be a guilt-free purchase of his Mercedes that he wants, but he couldn't bring himself to use the money in that way because he would get the Mercedes, but at what cost? Uh, what if I took this $30,000 and invested it or did this other thing? And so for me, humanly, what does this say to me? Well, anything we do on this earth comes with an opportunity cost to it in my opinion. So okay. let's say God's called you, but you're struggling here and there. And it kind of, cause I, this has happened to lots of people, the lure of going out and being successful in this world and making a lot of money and, and doing notable, laudable things. That's wonderful. But to me, what Christ is saying is, okay, you've, you know, and, and say in these cases that people kind of made a sacrifice and drifted away from God and they, but they, they had success in this lifetime that was your reward. Your reward was in this physical, temporary physical existence. You did really well. You lived a very comfortable life. Maybe you helped people. Maybe you invented something right. that was notable. Um, you know, I think it was, I think it's King Cyrus uh, of the, of the Medes and the Persians. There's some giant mountain where he had carved his name into it in a way that, you know, he's hoping this will last for thousands of years. Mm. Okay. So, so, he did a great job. People saw his name for thousands of years, but eventually even that will fade and pass away over time. And that's like, wow. that's the best he could do. Like nobody, you know, if the United States and we certainly teach this collapses and, and, and we go into captivity in America, as we think of it, it no longer exists. Then, then everything that happened in America is, is gone. Like all I go to, I always go to sports, all the sports records, you know, mm. most scoring guy of all time, most running, you know, yards as a running back, uh, most goals, you just take all of it. And that was awesome. And people were impressed and you were a sportsing legend. Okay. Wow. But at what cost? Yeah. And, and when, you know, all these other scriptures. And how long were, does it last? Yeah. yeah. You know what it is, what, what you read there in first John three, um, at least as, as far as those who are in the first resurrection, which is the better resurrection, if you're called now and you have an opportunity and you decide that things going on in life are just too tempting and you kind of, I don't even, I'm not even going to say you throw it away. It's just you drifted away and you chose other things. Well, guess what it comes at? The cost of being a child mm. to God, one of the sons of God. Um, now, eventually, God wants to reconcile everybody back to himself. And so in that sense, we'll all be in God's family. Maybe you could add some context to that. But, yeah. but you know, because there's some nuance in there. But, like, in terms of the first resurrection, that, Still. that comes around once. It, it And it'll always be the better resurrection. Yep. It's, uh, you know, the... Wow, Ms. Robinson, that's such a great example. It does make me think of... Um, uh, like if I go to poetry and stuff, there's the, the poem Ozymandias, you know, about uh, the great king, you know, that a traveler comes across his statue and it's clearly all broken down, et cetera. It's nothing now. But, you know, more than that, the, someone said once, I can't remember, I can't remember, it might have, might be a, I hate to fail to credit the person who had the thought because it's, uh, I remember really being impacted by it and I can't remember who it was. But it was said for, for mo most all human beings, you know, there, there is a moment when someone will think of you for the last time. Mm. And from that moment on, you are never thought of again. You might think, well, Napoleon, we're still thinking of Napoleon. Well, give humanity another 10,000 years. They might not. Of course, we won't survive that long. But also, no. not everybody's a Napoleon. You know who's not a Napoleon? I'm not a Napoleon, Mr. Robinson. And uh, I... The idea that there's, what can you achieve in this world that truly will be forever? Napoleon was great, but you know what? Was he, was he truly in a sense, the greatest general yep. of all time? No, there were great generals before him 
even some that were truly greater that we never think of anymore. They, they're not, not, they're not on our minds in any way. The own, like just pick some, think of some random Mesopotamian dude, if you want, who's just, who's working hard and worked hard to try to build the biggest farm along the Nile or would be the Nile, I guess, Mesopotamia, whatever he could forget all that, the fertile crescent, the only entities that bother to meditate on him at all anymore are God, the father and Jesus Christ looking forward to a time to resurrect him. Mm -hmm. Right. Everything that he invested that isn't centered around them is lost to time. It's yeah. only what matters to them that will actually be brought up and matter again. And what a great passage to remind you. I, I never, I've never thought of this passage in that kind of way of, of not just, uh, I, I tend to think of it as we well, should be aiming at higher uh, things and, and instead you want to get recognized for what it was and now ah, you got your reward. But it really does have a broader impact than that. Like how many rewards, how many things are people chasing for eternal recognition or for fame or, or just for the thank yous, whatever it is. And in the end, if that's what you're chasing for, well, you can make sure you get that. You know what that reminds me of? In fact, I had to look up the name so I'd get it right. I don't want Mark Sandor to be disappointed in me. <laughs> my, my historical facts. Okay. I don't know if I'll remember this exactly right, but Alexander the Great uh, this appears to be historically accurate near as we can tell. Okay. But there was a, a very prominent philosopher at the time named Diogenes mm. and he was really kind of eccentric and Alexander the great wanted to meet him. So he came in and found him. And, and so like the, it was told that, uh, the, 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 the story, the story that primarily seems to be accepted is that he showed up and he was standing there and he says, you know, Alexander the great says to him, are you Diogenes? And he says, yes, stand out of my sunlight. He was casting a shadow over it. <laughs> but one of the things he's alleged to have said to Alexander, the great Alexander, the great said, well, why are you, why are you, what are you doing? And he's kind of looks like he's sifting through the dirt and he says something along the lines of, I was looking for the bones of your father, but I couldn't discern them from the bones of slaves. Wow. And so the big picture thing was, and the Bible does absolutely have a concept like this. I think, I believe it is in Isaiah. Uh, it's possible this is Jeremiah, but it starts talking about, it starts talking about past dead army leaders of the Egyptians as if they could speak in the grave. Mm -hmm. they, they could not. This was, um, right. this is, we're using literary terms here and they welcomed the latest um, army generals that had died. And basically we all end up, in the same place, dead and in the grave. Wow. And, you know, but the, the idea there was, Hey, no matter how great your father was and Alexander the great, no matter how great you are at the end of the day, you die and your bones are in the ground. And if somebody came along and found them later, you wouldn't be able to pick out the bones they of Alexander the, the great from, you know, although they say they, they, they have found Alexander the greats. Yeah, maybe right? but, could be, but the idea was when it's all said and done, nobody can discern who you were. Well, you know, even that, uh, so, okay. It's like, that's fine. That's my bones. But what about my legacy? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, even that goes away because you know, who's not, who no longer can influence his legacy, Alexander the great. Mm -hmm. They made a movie about him, uh, Colin Farrell. Well, I didn't seen it, you know, it's probably terrible in a lot of yeah. ways, but, but regardless, uh, they made a movie about Napoleon recently, uh, with, uh, Joaquin Phoenix, yep. I think. Yep. And, who knows if they would have even liked those movies, right? Uh, Alexander he, he the Great or Napoleon. Yeah, I've, I've heard Napoleon that. Napoleon would not have liked that movie. Exactly. But you know what? For a lot of people now, that is Napoleon, what they saw in that movie. Uh, and then give us another uh, 80 years. What, how will he be thought of now? The fact is, you ha once you die, even your legacy is out of your control. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, how many of our of our greats of the past not only were had their... Uh, their stories shaped just for us, but the generations after us are shaping them anew. The fact is literally there's nothing you can do in this world that lasts forever. There's no reward that won't turn into dust that isn't anchored in what God is doing with you. Yeah. So, wow, yeah. Mr. Robinson, good one. Oh thank boy. You. Thank you. I'll, I'll take it. It would not have made my list, but it will from this point All forward. Right. So thank you, Mr. Robinson. All right. Well then you, you talk about wrapping up on this one. This one is uh, I have to cheat a little bit because I do tend to mainly think of this verse. However, it's only because when I read this verse, the setup always comes to mind. Okay. And so uh, I think this needs a little context. I, thank you. Okay. Thank you for saying that. That's, that's very validating. So you have uh, the apostle Paul, this is going to be in acts 26. The apostle Paul was under arrest because he was very good at getting arrested. 
It's <laughs> like a it's like a super talent. That's he right. Had. That's right. That's his that's his uh, mutant skill. So he's very good at getting arrested. So here he is. He is under arrest, and he has been uh, interviewed by various ones. And now, because of how things have been handled, he's he's going to speak before King Agrippa, who has some authority uh, in all of this. And uh, frankly, is he, is he a, a Roman? Uh, uh, Agrippa, he is. I think everybody kind of you you weren't you weren't ruling unless the Romans were, okay. were pleased with mm-hmm. you at that point. His he was not. Um, I can't remember his his wife was Jewish or oh maybe that that sounds right. I can't recall, but he 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 is he is aware of these things. And so he's speaking before Agrippa and he's relating his tale. And Agrippa even says later that, well, if this guy hadn't appealed to Caesar, we could, we yeah. could let him go. Let but, him. but Paul was on a mission and it was not a mission to free himself. It was a mission to take the gospel to Caesar's household. Cause Paul, was, Paul knew the meaning of the phrase, go big or go yeah, home. I was going to say those, those guys aren't built. We're not, <laughs> they're, they're just built different. Yeah, they really were. So, so as he's speaking to him, he's giving, he's giving his tale. And, and it's growing and it's growing. And after a while, Festus, who was a lower level functionary at this time, who, who had been interacting with Paul, uh, he, you get to Acts 26 and verse 24, it says now, and, and Festus, they were generally impressed with Paul for the most part, you know, but then at this point, Paul's like, what is going on? So in verse 24, because you realize that Paul hasn't been defending himself primarily. He's been preaching the gospel. He's using this not as an opportunity to save his own skin, but to try to convert the crowd, recognizing as we do that God has to call, but that doesn't change our commission to do our best to make disciples, Mm -hmm. right? If we're not trying, then God is having to work in spite of us. So Paul is doing his best to win, not just the crowd, but even Agrippa himself. He is going for the brass ring. And so Festus is just moved at this point. He's in wonder and confusion. So in Acts 26 and verse 24, it says, now speaking of Paul, now as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. Like all this stuff you've been studying is driving you crazy. What are you, what are you, what are you doing? And then Paul responds in verse 25, it says, but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. That is, Jesus Christ's execution and the talk of him being raised from the dead. And he says, look, the, the, the king is a sharp guy. He has seen what's going on. He's probably heard the tales. This was not done in a corner. I'm convinced that he's seen these things. And he turns directly to King Agrippa in verse 27, so bold, and says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. <laughs> There's this passion that, that Paul has about this. And oh, it's just so moving to me. And then verse 28 and some have interpreted this differently, like maybe he's being sarcastic or some. I personally do not think that he was. Verse 28, it says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Now, at that point, you got to realize King Agrippa is sitting in power and luxury. He's well cared for. Uh, he's he's definitely compliant with the expectations mm-hmm. upon him, which are a mix of, of Jewish and pagan and other things. Also, you could apply opportunity cost here. By the ah, way. there you go. You're right. You could. And... And yet here, and, and, and being a Christian, well, what was that? It was definitely looked down upon. You're seen as troublemakers, rabble rousers. Literally, here you have a leader in chains in front of him. And for him to actually say that, I just like to feel he was, he, he was, he was truly saying, you know, you almost persuade me, you know, to become a Christian. And then Paul, it's Paul's uh, statement after that that is my, my big picture verse. Now I'll do my best to keep my composure. But in verse 29, it says, and Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. So he was saying, look, I'm not, I'm not one you all to be arrested, you know, and, 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 you know, about to potentially be executed or whatever. But he says, you know what, King Agrippa? Absolutely whether it costs you your throne or not or anything else, mm-hmm. I wish that not only you, but every single person in this room could be just like I am and to know the truths that I know and to know the savior that I know and to know the, to walk the way of life that I walk, even at his, it has brought me, you know, whether it's heartache, you know, or fastings and difficulties here and there at the same time, he says, absolutely. I would to God that 
everyone here would become just like I am and know these things and have this relationship with their creator. And, you know, looking at Paul's life and what a challenge it was, you know, and I, I look at, oh, no, I'm, maybe I'm going to do a TWP and my air conditioner is just not quite cooling mm-hmm. me off mm-hmm. fast enough, Mr. Robinson or whatever the case is. And I look at Paul that's in shipwreck after shipwreck and look at everything he's been through. And yet he looks at this life that he has and says, man, I if only I could get the whole world to live this way. Mm-hmm. And so it hits me in two particular ways that make it a big picture passage. One is it reminds me of the joy of this way of life, of what a privilege it is, Mr. Robinson, that we have the opportunity, whether God called us out of this world or he blessed us by allowing us to be born into it, what an opportunity it is to be able to live this life and to know Jesus Christ and to know his father and have a relationship with them in love and grace and mercy and and what a privilege that is. But then also, it's a big picture verse because it highlights that a hundred percent, this was Paul's goal. His goal was not to free himself. This is what most people do. Throw yourself on the mercy of the court. You can get out of this. If anything, get out of this and you can go preach some more. Right. But no, he was on a mission and here he is where he should be pleading for his life. And he's not instead. He is trying to sell the gospel of God to the world. To me, it, Anytime I might have in my heart a, uh, a lessening of desire, just due to the cares of this world or whatever, to, to preach the gospel and to, to try to get this into more people's hands who need it, then this verse comes back and shames me that, that the Apostle Paul, it was his entire being to try to help others come to understand what we understand. And preaching the gospel of the world is the most noble thing the body of Christ can do. And we fail to do it to our shame. So, so yes, acts 26 and verse 29 for me is one of those, those wow. big picture passages. Uh, you, you, you've, you've uh, encouraged and exhorted me with your explanation <laughs> of these scriptures. Oh, thanks. And especially as you were going through it, I started thinking what a great way to draw out how n- none of us would, none of us, I can't think of maybe even other notable uh, persons in the Bible who would change places with Paul's life <laughs> yeah. because it was he, he himself who he's not one to brag. Of course, what, what, no, what is the term used? Uh, boast. boast. He's yeah. not one to boast, but even he says, look, and you know how many shipwrecks and beatings have I had and sleepless nights and cold and heat. Yeah. And so he's, he's struggled in his life. And then, but then think of the juxtaposition here. He's standing in front of Agrippa who's wealthy and has power and he wouldn't change places with him and his for, for anything in the world. Right, right. And, and, but then conversely, Agrippa is not willing to make that sacrifice and become in Paul's position for the long-term benefit. Mm. No, I'm going to stay here and keep my cushy, comfortable life. But at, at what cost? Like what's he turning down? He has literally has the apostle Paul talking to him and convincing him. And he's almost, he was almost he there. Almost does. That's right. The idea you think Agrippa would be able to say, you know, Paul, wouldn't you like to be like me? And Paul's saying, no, wouldn't you like to be like mm-hmm. me? And Agrippa's like, no, yeah, <laughs> almost not quite, but almost. <laughs> and God did not open that mind that day. And yet maybe he did open some in the crowd. You know, maybe there were some who were moved. So yeah, I, that, that passage you know, that's, that's a good think. point. I think it's easy to overlook, you know, you might, you might read this and if you were a little more cynical, think, so, you know, uh, so Paul was kind of wasting his breath, you know, he's talking to Agrippa and he doesn't, doesn't really get anywhere with him, mm-hmm. but we don't know who observed that, who it did influence. Mm-hmm. What a great way of uh, so many of the things in acts in particular, um, did he make, did, did Paul have any success with convincing the Jews that no, we're not reading some of Isaiah, right. And it talked about a suffering Messiah mm-hmm. and we just disregarded those scriptures and him I'm proclaiming to you. And they're like, they're not having any of it, but the other people around listening were influenced. Right. By, by Paul's right. Teaching, so. And I, I, I like to think that was the case there. Yeah. Well, uh, we hope that this is, has helped all of you. These were, you know, a little opening up into the ver- some some of the verses that really matter to us, and I hope, hope hope it encourages you not just to settle on these, but all of you teens and young adults and families listening. We hope it encourages you to go out go out yourself and go find those verses that do that for you. Definitely don't devalue the rest of God's word. Like in this case, it's only the rest of it in the context that makes this one verse stand out to me. But at the same time. 
as you're studying, as you're reading, if you come across something that really does help you see this larger picture that you will be able to hold on to for days to come, that whenever you need perspective or balance, you can come back and remind yourself of that fundamental truth, then take note of those. So, so again, hopefully this inspires you. Go out, go out and get yourself some big picture passages. Sit and run, sit.